Tenemos el primer original, chapa de oro, a 10, a 10, a 10. China is everywhere in the world today. Its people, its products, its food and its culture surround us. But many are nervous about its rise. China has changed the world, but we know little about how it has changed from within. And I wonder, is there a reason to fear China? This is where my journey begins. I can smell the gunpowder. I hear them, but I can't understand what they say. There's chaos. And then, I see the light. Today, everything glows in China. Today, the Chinese shine. They celebrate China's rebirth to the world. A new social and economic revolution has risen. Long live the revolution. Does the government represent the people in China? Actually, it's the same case of, of the United States. I mean, I mean, communists are just like a you know, rush of blood. It's not a zero-sum game. Um, they have to see that the pie can be shared. problems between the two that seem to dominate much of the rhetoric. They need to be on track uh, in terms of uh, accepting uh, the rules and responsibilities uh, that come with being a world power. It is a complex relationship between the two countries. The power over us is not restricted by anything. China has a rich history. Its first dynasty, the Xia dynasty, dates back to 2000 BC. After almost 4,000 years, imperial rule ended in China. In 1912, the Qing dynasty was overthrown and the Republic of China was created. A period of war followed as military regimes ruled one after the other. In 1928, the Kuomintang struggled to establish a nationalist government amidst a civil war with the Chinese Communist Party. Then, in 1949, the Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, proclaimed the People's Republic of China. My image of China was based on this period of history. But then I arrived in Beijing to find a bustling modern city, an absolute clash with what I thought I would find. Soon enough, I'm invited to Peking University by a group of young Chinese students who run a debate club. Here are students with different backgrounds, but one thing in common, academic excellence. In order to be in Peking University, you have to be the best of the best. They are amongst the best in a population of 1.34 billion people. True competition can only be understood in China and amongst this remarkable group of young people. I asked them, how is China seen today by the outside world? When the Soviet Union collapsed, many, I think many in the West was looking at a TikTok situation that when would it be the Chinese turn? Yeah. And, it, and I think this is really something that happened in the West and many people are still waiting. But the, the problem is many people have realized that China is not the Soviet Union that China is developing, in, in, if we look at Soviet Union in, before 91 and we look at China at this present stage, they are very, they're going different paths and we see that what was repeated in the Soviet Union may not actually happen in China. And I think this has surprised a lot of people because we thought the Cold War would also mean the end of uh, communism and socialism as well. 
And then suddenly we see China breaking away from its, willing to break away from its past and adopt different new experiments that no one has ever tried in this world before. Political change and the reforms will come as the economy grows because once you are economically capable, the people will be actually uh, uh, have the ability to seek for legal aid or to seek for reform in the government. I also feel that the Western world doesn't know us as we know them. Whenever you speak to them and talk about China, they was, they're still living in the days of red um, communism. Mm -hmm. um, Mao, they're still living in Mao, <laughs> Mao, Mao <laughs> Zedong era. They, they have not even seen the progression to Jiang Zemin into the <laughs> and, and all the, the, the leaders have changed. You know, sometimes they don't even realize. And if you talk about China, they will always say about the same few things. Cultural revolution, <laughs> Tiananmen. <laughs> and, but you see, that's the... That's the the, the living image, they think that Chinese people are being, they can't speak their mind, they don't have Facebook, um, <laughs> and they can't Google, their Google is limited, and that is the only thing that lives in their mind, but they don't see that the progress um, that has been made, and the fact that cultural revolution has already been declared a disaster by the Chinese education itself. Um, in Beidou, we can talk about very sensitive issues, in a, instance. like June 4th, but in a <coughs> private setting. As long as you don't talk about it in a political event, you can actually talk about it with your professors, they talk about it on their own. You talk when, about it in class. When the Nobel Peace Prize was given, everyone knew it on time, there was no time <laughs> delay in China. Um, we knew it was sensitive, but we were still able to talk about it freely. And, but I must say, Beida might be an exception. This might be an exception. I too imagine red China. There once was truth in this idea. From 1949 to 1976, the Chinese lived through a period of political fanaticism at the expense of economic growth. The Great Sparrow Campaign was launched as part of a public health campaign to eradicate the four pests. One of these pests was the sparrow as the Communist Party claimed they robbed people by eating grain seeds. The effect of killing these birds was that locust populations grew out of control and devastated Chinese crops. In 1958, the Great Leap Forward prohibited private farming. It promoted agricultural communes. Local officers were pressured to increase grain production. Many reported more than they produced. Little was left for distribution amongst the local population. At the same time, labor was diverted to steel production. This resulted in a famine that killed up to 30 million people. The Cultural Revolution showed that nothing was more important than communism. Meanwhile, the rest of the world was evolving. You are about to know the thrill of seeing that which has never been seen before. You are about to enter a beautiful, exciting, wonderful new world. The world of 1960. I want to emphasize from the outset that I believe that we have far more critical issues in the 1960 campaign. The spread of communist influence. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping steered China in a different direction with the open door policy. 
Its purpose was to modernize agriculture, industries, science and technology, and national defense. The open door policy marked the economic liberalization of China. In the South, five special economic zones were created with tax incentives to attract foreign capital and businesses. The Shenzhen Special Economic Zone was a pioneer in this experiment. Today, its high-tech industry is home to China's major manufacturing center, and China has become the world's second largest economy. I think communist China has given up its communist ideal, so it's just a it's just a front for for economic development. For Deng Xiaoping, his original idea is that. Uh, economic liberalization is a form of socialism. So that is the that's the discourse that is given. And so, but in reality, it's about capitalism and how people earn money. China is in many aspects more capitalist than many capitalist countries these days. But if you go to the more inland areas, you will still see that a lot of Chinese people are living at very poor living standards. And I think that. This is a policy that uh, Deng Xiaoping adopted himself, which is to allow a certain group of population to become wealthy, whilst the rest will wait. And I, I guess the problem now is how long are they waiting? Um, wealth distribution is a problem in China. I think that uh, China strayed from communism a long time ago to fully embrace capitalism. Despite the economic success, the party, I think it's uh, still very vulnerable um, because of all a series of issues, primarily lack of democratic elections, of course censorship. It seems like a, a, a system full of contradictions and probably what Deng said is very apt regarding this, like it doesn't matter if the cat is white or black as long as he catches the mouse. Why do you think then that the Western people, a lot of them, have this communist China idea? Actually, first, uh, they just put the Soviet Union on China. That's too, totally different, and uh, they all and their perception of China is out of date. They just look at, oh, 1980s Cultural Revolution, everyone's crazy, and the kind of communism is. Very, something very really dangerous to democracy but now China has changed a lot almost 40 years has passed so if still foreigners uh, foreigners do not learn new uh, latest information about China they, then they are totally kind of ignorant I think true blue communism no longer exists um, in, in China no there's no communism in China no not at all and most of the Chinese students, they, they actually look down upon it, the concept of communism. They never take it seriously. They think there's something that is imposed on them, and they are forced to learn this. Then it makes them more you know, convinced that it is not, it is a, not, it is not a good thing. Because if we, if we let we to freely choose what to learn, and if so many people choose to learn communism, it don't make you seem like it make make this seems like a good thing because so many people want to learn it. But once you impose something that most people don't like to learn, uh, without this kind of uh, coercion, uh, without this kind of compulsory uh, classes, we will think that without it, nobody will going to learn it. The Chinese Communist Party has been in power for over 60 years. There is a structured and planned succession of leaders every two five-year periods. Political reform requires the consensus of many and the vested interests of countless. In 2013, Xi Jinping replaces Hu Jintao as President and Secretary General of the Politburo Standing Committee. Effectively, a seven-member inner circle from the party's most influential members Xi Jinping will be the most powerful man in the world. He is also a princeling, or the son of one of China's revolutionary leaders, which is the closest thing to Chinese aristocracy. As such, Xi Jinping has political capital, but does he have the will to push for political reform? 
I think they've been smart in the way they've approached it because after the Cultural Revolution, I think they lost a lot of legitimacy in the eyes of the public and uh, they saw the best way to re-establish that and re-establish their power in the country was uh, to pursue uh, economic strength. And I think uh, by doing so, they've kind of shown to the people that communism can work for the country and can work for, for them, the people. Economically, we are going so fast and our confidence has been accumulated and the people's expectation of the political system, they want this kind of improvement of development in the political system because as fast as the economic system or economic growth. Does the government represent the people in China? Actually, it's the same case of, uh, of the United States. People, although in China there is no general election, but the also representatives elected by the by from the county, from the province, and those de delegates or those representatives come together to Beijing each and every year on March. This is called the National People's Congress, and they also bring people's voice to the central government. So it's the same of the United States. If you were asking uh, the, the, the President uh, Obama whether the government represents its people, then the answer will be the same, I think. So in China, people, uh, government can represent people, but it do not represent all the people because some people will do harm to others. Also a misconception of many foreigners. I mean, I mean China have a election law, okay? And China has very specific procedures how election should happen. And it's actually happening according to the law, which is not that democratic, but it's of course an improvement, improved version of what happened in before, you know, the PRC. I think democracy that actually works everywhere it is working in China. I, I myself does not think multi-party system fit China. Let's be practical that we are not, we're not, we does not fit the uh, five, four year, five year term and general election all over the China. No, we, we definitely want stability. And stability sometimes does not mean, uh, stability entails you have to sacrifice some something, but China needs it. This is Wandong province. It is the most populated province in China, with 104.3 million people. The population of this Chinese province is larger than the populations of Ireland, the United Kingdom, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Belgium, and Finland combined. The general argument is that China is too big to hold elections. Chinese citizens over 18 have the right to vote and be voted at the local level. But independent candidates don't stand a chance against the candidates of the Communist Party. The party advocates socialist democracy with Chinese characteristics. Is this a contradiction in terms? Do you think the Communist Party represents the Chinese people? That's a question that only Chinese people can, uh, can answer, I think. I don't think, it, I don't think it represents it, but I don't think of it much as a problem, as I don't feel represented by my, my government. I think democracy with Chinese characteristics, uh, if if you can look at it that way, is is more or less that the government represents the people in making decisions and choosing the best way for these people to carry on. So um, there's not much understanding. Of, there's not much concept of elections or much not much concept of um, having uh, a diverse range of views. Because I think it also goes back to the original traditional Chinese concept of uh, maybe Confucianism because what you have is somewhat like a philosopher king who knows the truth and understands what is best for the people and he, and he represents these people to do 
to do whatever is he feels is best for them. I, I think none of my friends have ever been invited to vote, you know, for whatever um, government or whatever levels of government here. Um, so that's not that's not representatives. They're, they don't represent us. I think the government for us is more like um, like parents. The party doesn't represent the people. The party has never represented the people. We've been living under totalitarian governments for thousands of years. So for a lot of us, this is life. We just have to accept it. We never thought things could be otherwise. Some people are afraid of democracy. They think, they think democracy is not for China. Yeah, uh, Chinese people is um, uh, they they are used to obey. They are used to, they are used to something. They are not used to uh, to 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 this. So so they think it's not for China. Yeah, the youth in China mostly think of that. What do they teach you in school that democracy is? Uh, us is democracy. Yeah, our Chinese democracy. We have a special uh, democracy. Yeah. You see democracy in Taiwan, which I suspect is working. But if you live in China, you see the news is all about, like, um, I don't know whether they call them congressmen, um, like the representatives. Um, they all fight each other, they punch each other in the face. It's like, it's like theater. And you think, oh, we don't want that. Many people question that why Chinese people do not, do not turn up against, for a long time, I mean, against the, the communist government. So, I mean, my explanation is that if you read books, I mean, uh, or read stories of in the Chinese history, basically, Chinese, Chinese people's good, the image of a good government is different from the Western one. I mean, so that's where I think when you ask whether China has a has a clash civilization clash with the Western one, I think this is an example. So, so in Chinese people's mind, most people, I mean, if a if a gov a good government means that a government that keeps people alive instead of better people's life. So, um, I mean, this kept happening in Chinese, Chinese history. Chinese people only turn up against the government when their survival is endangered. So I'll tell you a story to illustrate that. So a friend of mine, um, when he take, took a taxi, when they heard the news uh, reporting that the Egyptians and Tunisians are taking a revolution, so the reaction of the taxi driver was, uh, why are they turning up, uh, up against their government? I mean, their government is not letting them to die, is not starving them. Why are they doing so? If someone's gonna use, uh, use something to take advantage, to provoke people to, to fight against the government, that will cause instability. And people in China pay very much attention to stability and development. In the West, we are all told that China is a place where you are not free. Yet, when I first arrived, I had a newfound sense of freedom. Freedom from fear. Coming from a city where insecurity is a concern, I felt safe in China. It was only later, when I tried to do what was commonplace at home, that I missed what I had taken for granted. If I would go there and I would ask, I'm pretty sure that they would not tell me exactly what they think, maybe because they're afraid of the consequences. How free do you feel? Absolutely, here? absolutely free. I mean, but I mean, it's, you can say what you want, but of course, for instance, if I'm in a, a meeting about, by the party members, by the Congress, there are certain things I, I will not say. Um, like, 
The same way I would not say, let's say, certain things within, let's say, the American Congress or in the Senate. Um, not because... But uh, I think the main difference is that if I say in China, definitely the repercussions are more serious because there are certain laws that are very loosely interpreted and not in my favor, and I could be, uh, you know, in prison fairly easily. In the United States, I can say wherever I want, um, but I won't be in prison. But the penalty that comes will just come in a different way. For instance, in the United States, most probably I will have the media lashing out against me. I would have parties lashing out against me. In China, I'll have the police lashing out against me. So in that sense, yes, there is a difference. You, you can talk about things privately, most of, most of the cases fine. I can talk about a lot of things with my friends, with my family, and it's fine. I think I can do a lot of things. I feel it's really free. <laughs> they have an enormous amount of freedom in their day-to-day -day lives. You know, that's, that's China's amazing authoritarian innovation, is this, this tremendous personal social freedom that, that most people in China have now that is not the usual way that authoritarian countries behave. And about, you know, about the freedom of the, of the speech, about some general free concepts that is very familiar to the Western people. Um, I'm indifferent. <laughs> really, I'm indifferent. I think, uh, firstly, when you look back at what the Chinese government says, it is about uh, freedom to to live a good life and freedom to freedom to live well. So compared to China before the economic reform, citizens were both unfree politically and they were also not free economically because they could not have new opportunities and new options. China today, I think, provides the citizens with a lot of options. It provides them a lot of opportunities to explore and to try new things. I guess I need to define freedom first. That as you see, as you wish, we come here to the local neighborhood and we see this is not as glamorous as uh, famous places or locations in Beijing. This is pretty local. I want to say that I'm not rebuilding something ugly in China. This is true, this is local. But, and this is a road that I have to go almost every week in order to buy something or for or go to, go to supermarkets. So whenever I come to this road, I, I'm asking myself, is this a place I always want to stay for my whole life? Is this a place that I really um, love? I mean, I love, my, I love the place I live in, but I'm seeking for change. I, I think I can achieve something based on my ability and based on what I've experienced. So freedom for me is that I don't have to go through this. I have my own options. I don't have to do this. As a liberal citizen, I do not feel free. I mean, my and the main threat comes and the main threat comes from the threatening of other people. I mean, just like, um, just like. Um, but I mean, this is. I don't know. I don't know how to say this. I mean, this is very tricky because, for example, if you speak something like, uh, like anti-Semitics in the states, you also get punished or in certain kind of way, right? I mean, whether by media or anything like that, and you are, you will be called as a racist also. But I don't know. But I, I do not feel like that people are respecting my liberal point of view. Because, I mean, that would be comparing anti-Semitism to being against the party? Right. So are you free? No, <laughs> no, uh, of course I'm not free. Like, I, for example, I, um, well, th there's the freedom of speech. Um, I, it, it is possible for me to say something and, um, and then I disappear from the face of Earth, and nobody know what happened to me. I mean, why do you understand that other people feel so free here? I mean, a lot of people I've spoken to, they tell me. Yes, I'm. I'm. Okay. Um. Uh, I don't know. Okay, this part might you have to cut off because I okay, will say then, something. Okay. And then we, then we just turn off the camera and say. No, you can keep that, but I mean, it depends on how I develop in my later life. 
this media censorship in China is brilliant, brilliantly done. Censorship can include political and social issues, like environmental degradation. This is one of the bad pollution days in Beijing. The press calls it fog. The truth is not always clear in China, but technology has offered a gateway for public discussion. The Great Firewall of China is difficult to cross. It blocks social networks like Twitter and Facebook, but Chinese microblogs, or Weibo, have opened a crack through the wall. When a little girl was run over twice and ignored by 18 bystanders, Chinese netizens blogged about it in outrage. They questioned the lack of social values and worried about where Chinese society is headed. If microblogs are used by over 200 million people, is this a stepping stone towards freedom of speech in China? What can you write about? Oh, you can write about um, how the government is making progress. Basically, basically, um, the kind of report that would make people feel good. It's feel good journalism. Um, don't write anything to upset them or piss them off. Um, you know, have you know have、um, kitties, puppies, bunnies,、um, anything that would make you feel good. Pamper the people, and that's okay. There are a hundred percent censored in a very very targeted way. Right, so the, the the Chinese government is by far the most advanced, sophisticated, authoritarian government in the history of the world when it comes to media control and censorship. And what they have innovated beyond what any other government has ever managed is to create an environment where, in a lot of ways, the conversation, the media appears normal and appears free. There's there's a million things that you can talk about, no problem. Social issues are often widely debated. So, if you're the type of person who doesn't really care that much about politics, you might not even notice that there's anything weird about your media. You know, it doesn't even come up. But when it comes to、uh, you know criticisms of the party, or it comes to any sort of sensitive topics that embarrass them,、um, you know, those are just surgically removed instantly. I, I sometimes I feel. I feel like government is taking its people as idiots. Okay, it's like they think its people don't they don't they don't read external sources of news or whatever, and that's just really 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 annoying because we know what is going on there and why are still hiding hiding it from us.、Uh, people's attention on the internet. Uh, has a you no know, very positive result recently. We can see there are many injustices happening in China, and you know the justice was defended through the pressure of the netizens in China. Yeah, that that is something that、uh, that a lot of Westerners find odd is that Chinese people、uh, are allowed to communicate on these things. There is a microblog in China. Oh, they do have something that's similar to Twitter. But I thought China was completely censored. I thought Chinese people weren't allowed to communicate or even get together in groups. There was a case called "My Father Is Li Gang" case, where there was a university student in Hebei, a son of privilege, driving a sports car around his university campus, and、uh, he ran into a girl and killed her. But what came out and what was spread around on the microblogs was that he shouted "Wo ba shi Li Gang," which means "My father is Li Gang." Like, don't do anything. His father was a, a, a local official. This became huge on the microblogs.、Uh, it was it was passed around incredibly quickly, and it exposed this culture of corruption, where you can get away with things if you're if you know someone, if your family member is someone. But the fact that this went round on the microblogs does show that、uh, it, it. I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't censored. Maybe that was because people the the government didn't get a get a hold on it quickly enough. But、um, it was passed around, and everyone knew about it. Um, the father ended up having to go on TV and apologize for his son,、uh, and ended up crying. And the son went to jail. Chinese government want a revolutionary change instead of a revolutionary one. So 
but that the, that's the problem. I mean, the evolutionary change is not keeping up with keeping up with the worsening of people's life, especially of the lower class. The start of the Arab Spring. Tunisians protest against corruption, their lack of political freedom, and high unemployment. The Western media calls it the Jasmine Revolution, alluding to Tunisia's national flower. At the same time, Jordanians pour into the streets, Yemenis cry for reform, and similar demands are shared in Libya. A wave of protests sparks in Egypt, demanding the resignation of Hosni Mubarak, who had been in power for 30 years. They achieve this. Every other country in the world, the Middle East Revolution was front page news, day after day after day, week after week. It was the biggest story. Country after country is falling, everything's going crazy, right? Huge story. Not in China. Right? In China, it's buried. I mean, they, again, it's, it's this subtle thing, right? They didn't like censor news about Egypt. That would be going too far, that would be over the top, and they're not that stupid. But instead of like having all of this all over the front page, stories about democratic revolutions and images of like a million people in a square with the army surrounding it, right? very delicate -ish images. You don't want to remind Chinese people of anything else and you don't want them to get any ideas. You know, they, they bury that stuff on page 10 and turn it from a giant story into a little one. You would think that the, the, the Middle East um, uprising shows the party that the people can overthrow a government. But then again, I think both the party and the people know that China's situation is very different. In China, citizens have the constitutional right to apply for permission to protest. The Beijing Public Security Bureau has the faculty to grant this permission, in theory. In February 2011, Overseas Chinese dissidents use Twitter to call for a Jasmine Revolution in China. They were to do it shortly before the National People's Congress met in Beijing. The National People's Congress is China's parliament, with 3,000 delegates elected by China's provinces, autonomous regions, municipalities, and the armed forces. Just a couple of blocks away from where the highest authorities in China were meeting is Wanfujing Street, where activists wanted to make history. Security was increased. In the streets, there were more police than civilians. Curious bystanders wandered about. Cleaning trucks swept the main pedestrian street in order to prevent groups from gathering. What it mainly was was from what I heard, it's mainly a, it was a non-event. So there, was, there were calls for protests, but very few people turned up. In fact, many people come to Beijing to, um, to complain to the government, right? But usually, these attempts are not successful. So the common response is that people just give up and they just choose not to do uh, what they believe. Like, the people who don't want the party they know they don't want the party, but they don't know what they do want. Because they haven't lived under a democracy, they don't know what it is like. Yeah, we've been through a lot of um, miseries, and our, I mean, some leaders have really um, sacrificed their, their lives for us, and that's honorable. But at the same time, you see what's happening around you is like, the authorities are just corrupted and they don't give a shit about, sorry, they don't really care about people's lives. So how could you, how could you love them, you know, while, while you're hating them? It's just, uh, it's just impossible. The party wants every Chinese person to think, we are China, right? The government is China, the Communist Party is China, we're all China together, so if, if, some, if the New York Times writes a negative newspaper, or writes a negative article, or says something bad about the government, it's saying something bad about China. People who want change, who, people who want to see change, people you would expect to go and protest didn't go because they didn't think it was, it was going to work. 
um, is fear at the bottom of the whole thing? Fear, and is also a sense of uh, helplessness. It's like, so what if we went? You know, um, it probably won't help much. There is a saying that you can't awake a, a person that pretend to sleep. Yeah. They know everything about the society, the dark side, but they prefer pretend to sleep. Yeah. I have more pressure than I expected from the school. Yeah. The classmates, they, they look at me as, a, as if I'm going to the jail or something. Really? Yeah. They, if they, they ask me if I, if I worry about going to the prison. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how far the government can go. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know either. Yeah. Jiang Fang Zhou shared these thoughts with me. I never knew if she laughed innocently or nervously at the idea of going to prison. Through her blog and novels, she questions why the Chinese youth is afraid of politics. Her explanation is that they defend their government as if it were the legacy they are about to inherit. Far from being politically correct, her critical voice strikes a sensitive chord. Yet, as an icon of the generation of the 90s, she has far more liberties than others. Many in this film have worried their opinions might draw unnecessary attention to themselves or their families. The power over us is not restricted by anything. After months in China, I made a decision to interview a member of the Communist Party. I wanted to get the other side of the story. His name was Rao Chiking. The understanding in China is that there's no alternative to the Communist Party. Before the interview, I was petrified that he would ask me for a journalist visa I did not have. If he did, the best case would be the confiscation of my work. The worst? An indefinite stay in China. 1.3 billion people that don't have a voice. You think we're not scared? It was before going into this room that I fully understood what risk meant. Whoever is the first one to break any rules gets the axe. Just like walking up these stairs, I then hoped the effort would be worth the journey. You only have one life. Why risk it? Was that it? Far beyond my expectations, what I learned was that Rao Chiking was not just the face of the party, but a professor, a person with his own unique voice. But what surprised me the most was that I was free to ask questions. Is this becoming the norm in China, or was I merely lucky? I came to China without knowing if I could even do this documentary. No one really knows where to draw the line between what they can say and what they better not. In light of this uncertainty, people self-censor. I am at a crossroads in the story I want to tell, the story I was told. I ask myself if they will be safe after everything they've shared. But censoring myself would be censoring those who want to speak and be heard. This is the generation of the one-child policy. They push for change in their own way. And they are the future leaders of China. The Chinese have had many breaks in history and tradition. They have proven once and again that they are flexible and can adapt to the most radical changes. One of the biggest reforms was the one-child policy, established in 1979. An only child represents the pride or shame of the family, and embodies everything that grandparents and even parents can never aspire to achieve. Each person in the family 
plays a role in a machine that otherwise runs by itself. Currently, if a couple is composed of two people without siblings, they may have two children of their own. Still, there is now a generational gap that separates past from present. From the first day to school, I think, yeah, our, our one of our school slogan is "Yu Hong Yu Zhuan." It means, uh, royal to the, yeah, royal to the to the party. <laughs> so I think I, I was shocked, you know, the first time I saw it in in the wall. It is is written "Yu Hong Yu Zhuan." Or I, I, yeah, I'm shocked. So the from the first day. Then I observe my my classmates. Are they challenge the slogan? Uh, are they obey it? Yeah, I think I think they they believe that and they do as the slogan tells them. Like my mother, who has uh, two other sisters, both of them are party members. And after I mean they get better jobs actually, and after they retire they get better uh, pensions. And my mom was kind of the um, rebellious one when she was young, and she didn't join the party. So when she gets older, uh, she sees how, you know, the difference between her life and her sister's lives. So she, she told me, okay, you, you, gotta, you gotta join the party. That's, you get, then you get better, better um, payment. Um, but the other day, like, my mother and I, and also one of her sisters, were, were having lunch together. And my mother talked about me not joining the party thing. And her sister was like, why, why join the party? You know, the party is the most corrupted. Don't do that. Three, my parents' generation and me, mine, they're totally different. China has developed so much, and in the past, people do not live in very good condition. They, they are consider something of eating and clothing, but we now are pursuing a kind of better life. And people go through cultural revolution, they receive education of Moism, but we now receive education and acquire knowledge both from ch ch Chinese tradition and outside the world. So we can get more information and we are more open-minded. There is this, this big um, confusion amongst a lot of people about do I, like, uh, do I, am I a slave to the West? Do I, do I love the West? Do I hate my own country? So that, that makes a lot of Chinese people confused, um, especially young Chinese people who have been raised in a sort of more Western-influenced culture in China. I feel like when I'm learning this language, I'm not only learning the characters or the words, I'm actually learning the whole culture. Because now I can feel that some of my minds are more open, are different from my fellow peers, like the ones who, doesn't, who don't master English that well. I can feel the change and I feel um, sometimes even more comfortable about the Western values, like freedom, like uh, democracy somehow. Uh, the main difference between my generation and my parents' generation is, is that they had more choices in front of them when they decided how they should improve their lives. But the problem, so for example, with my generation is that we don't have much to choose. I mean, I mean the, the situation, uh, the, the system has been already established. Um, people who can earn money has earned their money and who can gain power have already had their power in hand. So um, basically, I mean, if your parents uh, do not have either power or, or, or money, um, unless you are top students, I mean, especially you should, when, when I say top students, I really mean top, top students in China. Unless you're top students, you basically um, always belong to where your parents belong, I mean, from the so same social class. Family system is actually a mutual assistance system uh, in China because in China, in a long history, there's the absence of the insurance system. This kind of relationship serves as a mechanism of you know, providing mutual assistance financially, uh, mentally, and from all other aspects. So maybe one child, uh, like me, I have to support my father, my mother, and then I have to support maybe my grandfather, my grandmother, I mean, in, in the both sides. I think uh, we all the generation, Chinese, generally speaking, we work very hard 
young generation, I think, they grow up during the, uh, the change from the uh, planned market to the free market. So they just uh, rush money. In August 2008, amidst rumors of a financial crisis, Beijing hosted the Olympic Games. China spent $43 billion for a two-week sports event, double the combined cost of the Olympic Games in Athens and in Sydney. China is anxious to regain its status in the world and to be recognized as a powerhouse that it is. Any more questions? The Chinese are trying to understand the West better. About 300 million Chinese are learning English, compared to 40 million people who learn Mandarin. Every rising power wants to be perceived as good, as friendly, as not an enemy of all over the world. We, we does not want to be antagonized. And uh, I've seen some new developments that like uh, the first China promo has been released on the New York Times uh, Square. I wouldn't say it was particularly successful because there was a load of Chinese faces that no one, no one really recognized and names that no one recognized, which in terms of like whether or not that's successful as a soft power initiative, it's probably not great because people don't like to see a load of faces that they don't recognize with the words Chinese money underneath it. Um, because they think, who are these guys, you know? What, what are they, are they going to be, uh, like, are these guys going to be owning me soon? <laughs> I don't think you will ever have the kind of soft power that, let's say, the United States had. Because I don't think you'll be able to win over a lot of Western nations. I don't think it has the common language and the common cultural background allows Westerners to say that China is one of us. So they always see China as an uncertain dragon. They see it as someone who is... They, they, they just do not understand uh, China. And so with that, there's a lot of suspicion and there's a lot of uncertainty. Sometimes I feel the Westerners are um, looking at us with a pair of glasses and they see the things they want to see, they neglect a lot of things, they can't. What do you think about this idea that China will be, you know, the next superpower? I think she, she's a different superpower as compared the, to, to America or the West that we saw, or the British, you know, the colonial empire, that kind of thing. Um, from, they seem to be a more profit-oriented um, <laughs> superpower. So long as, so long as there, there is room for them to develop their economy, so long as um, the Chinese people will benefit, so long the economy will grow, I think they will try and put their presence there. But they do not have what we call an ideological superiority. Uh, they, China does not seem to be one who thinks that socialism is the best policy and tries to spread that around the world. It's not something that they believe in. And that's, com that's different uh, as compared to, let's say, the West, who believe they had a white man's burden. Power comes from economic strength nowadays. I think when you look at America, I mean, they're, they're going to be untouched militarily, but they're $16 trillion in debt, and three or four trillion of that is owed to China, which gives them huge control over, over the way America is run, whether the people realize it or not. I think it's impossible for, for China to become, to, to, to become a superpower in the 20, 21st century. So this is a multilateral world, but not a superpower. And uh, if, if China really wants to be a superpower, there's, there should be some improve, improvement in its political system and its, you know, all other systems. So, so, yeah, so superpower is very ridiculous, I think. Next superpower. Okay, to answer this question, you just go to the west part of China. Then you'll find, oh, Commonly, people just visit Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. It's very big cities in China. But if you go to the west part, that totally, totally different scenario you will see. I need people to know that stop be like, oh, China is growing so fast. It's it's not. It's like this little plant. This little plant, and then you put a brick on it. You, you, you put a heavy, heavy brick on the little bean sprout and somehow because this, this power of life, this bean sprout 
managed to grow a little bit. And then the world is like, oh my God, it grew one inch. But think about how much this plant can grow if you take this break off. What can be expected for other countries if China takes a leading role in world politics? What I can tell is that All I can tell is that a, a authoritarian government cannot take the role as a, as a global leader. That's from, that's, that's totally, you know, um, because they simply do not know the, what the responsibility of a good government means. It's like one day you stay at home and you think that your country is the best country in the world and then suddenly you see another whole country rising and um, so it's natural for them to feel fear or uh, that kind of feelings. So in this way, once they, and, and that's, that's the point where they started to learn about China. And so if you start from that point, I guess you will kind of be biased from the starting point. We're so used in the West to having this culture that is like a, a global passport. I mean, everyone, everyone knows about Western culture. It's the dominant global culture. And so that causes a lot of insecurity when we start thinking about, okay, well, maybe, maybe we don't have this divine right to, to be the, 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 the global dominant culture. And I think that we do not take the time to actually study China and, and see China through its own eyes. We, we try to judge China based on our, on our own ideas, on our own prejudices, on our own fixed uh, concepts of what things should be like. Why does the world fear China? They don't, simply do not know China. China has two... I mean, I mean, I'm not boasting here. I think China should always stay, should stay, should stay humble, you know. But China really has a very long history and very complicated and they have a culture of their own. Um, they are trying to interact with the world. Um, but many people, because China is just starting to rise from a communist system, many people still think that we still had this you know, old system, old mentality, which part of them we have, but it's a much longer historic. I mean, I mean, communists are just like a you know, rush of blood. It, it adds very quickly, it adds off very quickly, adds away very quickly. Instead, the culture that China really has stays, stays on. I think the world has a misconception of China. I think the, the world thinks that China is aggressive and uh, out for other countries, but my impression of China is not that way at all. It's very peaceful, very nice people. Where are you from, sir? I'm from the USA. The ability is quite important and peace is quite important. So in from Chan Chinese philosophy, China will rise peacefully and China will not make troubles to other countries because it also causes instability in China. In, in the part, uh, southern, his, uh, southern years history, China has experienced so much wars. Chinese people now are crying for peace. Uh, when I buy something in the store and I see made in China, I'm not very happy about that because I, I, I buy things made in the USA. What the world think about China without coming to China? That's your question, right? Chinese people are really evil, they are going to flood up our market with cheap stuff and we, we will we broke down, the company will go to bankruptcy and uh, the whole country will be a crap. Well, that's, uh, that's something, a, a really extreme vision of what can happen that I don't think will happen. How do you think the West sees China? I think it's a it's a love hate is a love hate relationship. I think they love them because in my moment of economic crisis, uh, we see the credit crunch. China bought my bonds, you know. So, um, in a way, it's it's a it's a rescue attempt.
but I think it's also a very much is a, is a hate relationship as well because we get a lot of made in China goods flowing to the United States. We get a lot of Chinese brain, which I think is the is the part that hurts the most. It's not so much the products; it's the brains, the Chinese brains that's flowing to their markets, and the the threat is I I believe overwhelming uh, for them. But I think the West needs to understand that there are certain things about them, the certain assets that they have that the Chinese would maybe never learn or will take at least a few hundred years to develop and the rule of law is one of those huge gifts that the West has for the East and they, they shouldn't feel that paranoid uh, because gone is the day, gone are the days when we have to live in a cold war and we're always in a competitive mode, it's not a zero-sum game, um, they have to see that the pie can be shared. We change but we change evolutionarily and uh, in a different way perhaps and uh, I think um, I think I think people should give 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 China more time and uh, to see what's happening we know there is history we know there is some sort of kind of discrimination we know they have different ideas with us but we think the most important thing I think most of the Chinese people especially students think that we have to do we have to succeeding in something and to prove that we are as good at them or we are doing something that is okay and, and I think it's it's not kind of threat to others or we are doing something that just like others common people we just want to have a better life. What did you accept to the interview? Accept the interview? I found myself had something to say that when the professor told me that the lady actually want an honest answer, want uh, something aside from what we can generally see from newspapers, media, both Western and Chinese. And I found, well, I, I do have my thoughts and I want to share with the lady. I, and uh, it may be personal, it may be political, it may be something, it may be something sensitive. But I like to say that's how, that's how I think. And I may not be that fully representative, but um, I guess I can represent a group of people here, students, youth. Thank you. In the past, people who have failed to embrace change have been left behind. The Chinese have had to adapt to drastic changes in their history. Going from a feudal system to a communist one, before leaping into capitalism. They have struggled to get where they are. China is on a bullet train towards a destination unknown. Like other countries, this giant has internal problems to solve. It has to rescue 180 million people out of poverty, face increasing social inequality, solve internal ethnic divides, and as the economy continues growing, the party might have to respond to greater demands for freedom. Until now, China's astonishing economic growth has overshadowed the cracks in their one-party political system. The West hopes that economic development will lead to political change. But China is unique. Democracy has not come with capitalism. Democracy is no longer a Western concept. China has a complex system of governance. The West is still waiting for the Chinese Communist Party to fall but the party's color has faded in order to survive. Communist ideology has walked out on China. Its socialism is plagued with capitalist dreams. So do we fear China for its communist past or for its capitalist future? And who fears who? Suspicion goes both ways. In China, a Western model challenges the party's grip over the masses. Whilst the West has been taken aback by the incredible success story that is China, forcing Westerners to challenge indoctrinated notions of superiority. In the end, we have more to fear from an unstable China than from a rising China. China is diverse. Its people are diverse. And it changes at its own pace. China has opened up to the world they opened up to me, and we share this with you. Understanding each other might just be the key to preparing for the future. And today, 
there is no future without China. We must give China time to show us its new face. And we must take the time to know them. Today, I feel I truly see China. Today, I have hope. Hope in a nation none of us should fear.